Grace Lambert, burlesque. <gasps> burlesque? What did you do in burlesque? Well, you know what you do to a banana before you eat it? Well, I do that to music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't talk to you anymore. I'll see you tonight if nothing happens. Goodbye, darling. What? Nothing. Short of death can keep me away. You're sure you never ran across him in Manila? He's kind of tall and blonde and has a funny little lisp. Well, not much of a lisp. Just enough to sound cute. Hey, nobody in the Marines that lisps. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. And welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen, joined as always by our newly minted Samantha Richardson. Emily is taking a break to continue her adventures in a real life version of Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. But in her place, we have an old friend. You know her. We know her. She is the amazing and awesome Drea Clark. Drea, how are you? Old as in we go way back. Obviously, I'm youthful, yes. forever young. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're perpetually youthful Mildred Natwick of the group. Yes. Never Perfect. forget. I don't remember which episode you told that story about. I think it was our Barefoot in the Park. I don't even know if we did a Barefoot in the yep. Park episode. Yep. Yeah. No, that was but certainly it. Go back and listen to that one. I'm very happy that you were able to pop on to talk with us about the 1943 war movie, Cry Havoc. Backstory to that, Samantha recommended it on one of her discoveries lists, what, 2018, 2019? A while back, yeah. Yeah, and then I watched it, and then I put it on my discoveries list, and Drea had not seen it. No. So, full circle moment, bringing it back, and Drea has now seen it. And we're going to find out what she thinks about it. But before we get to Cry Havoc, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features, looking at remakes, based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime, and our new series. But have you read the series where we look at literary adaptations? We just did our episode on The Phantom of the Opera. We have our last episode of 2023 looking at the dueling versions of Jane Eyre starring Orson Welles in 1943. And spoiler alert, it gets into some very weird conversations, but you're going to want to be on the lookout for that. We also give out regular care packages and movies and gifts and let you guess on an episode. It's at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget that I have my book, but have you read the book 52 Literary Gems that inspired our favorite movies and Emily Edwards has her Viviana Valentine, Girl Friday Mysteries. You can order those wherever you get books. And the Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by Samantha herself, as well as Terrence Hilt, featuring your favorite stars. The holidays are a coming, so that means shameless plug for our Jean Judy Makoko mugs. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. Try havoc. This is directed by Richard Thorpe. It is a chronicle of the experiences of a group of Army Hospital volunteers, all women, stationed in Bataan during World War II, and is a who's who of actresses, including Margaret Sullivan, Anne Southern, Joan Blondell, Faye Bainter, Marcia Hunt's in there, Ella Raines. There is a cavalcade of ladies in this movie. Samantha and I... You can go back and listen to the Discoveries episode. We both love this movie. I want to hear from Drea Clark herself. What did you think of Cry Havoc? What a loaded question. First off, I love it. Put me on the spot every time. Overall, I very much responded to this. You pack something with this many actresses that I like. It's really hard to derail my enjoyment. No matter what I get from it, I'm going to be getting something. There's a couple really noteworthy performances in this that was so exciting to see. That's what makes a discovery, right? When you're like, oh, and Southern step back. I love those kinds of moments. There's certainly a critical I I could cast to the idea. It's one of those films that is resolutely wearing its pedigree as a stage adaptation. It's shot very well for something that is very claustrophobic and in like five sets they're in this bunker space for so much of it 
and yet it's beautifully lit. The camera is always in interesting places. I'm getting curious groupings of how it's framing these women and what that's telling me about their dynamic. There's no not bringing my modern perspective to it. I do wish they unlocked it a little more. There's so many scenes in this. There's a whole scene where they're talking about cooking. I'm like, is there not a kitchen you could be in right now actually cooking? There's a lot of tell, don't show. It's that, oh, I would have liked to have seen it pushed further in the world building. Because the other thing I really am going to always love about this, there are approximately 4 billion movies about World War II, and three of them are about women, especially women who are on or near the front lines in some sort of capacity. They are both trained and untrained. There's a volunteer component, so it's putting them on a more even standing with the soldiers who are there and putting their lives at risk. There's a nobility to what these women are doing and that every decision they make when they're given, you are now free to go. And they don't, they stay with it. I really love seeing a sort of moment in history through this perspective. And then again, the combating of even when I can tell it's written and directed by men. There's so many elements of this. I'm like, oh, God. I feel like I saw just the idea. I'm like, what if Ida Lupino had made this? That idea of, oh, so close to overall, very enjoyable, but a lot of fun, complicated thoughts. How's that? I'm all for fun, complicated thoughts. Yeah. This is a movie about war and death and sadness that also culminates with a not love triangle where it's two women sparring over an unseen man. I do appreciate how this has a women vibe, and I don't mean a women as in, like, it's got women, but it's, like, the film, The Women. I was going to say that, too. There are men in this movie, but the main man is just a disembodied voice, and the emphasis is on the female volunteers. When I think of World War II movies... I often think of men being men, but also when I do see women in these movies, a lot of them are comedies, like Never Wave It a Whack, or what is it? Not Skirts Ahoy, but they all have campy little names, and I love that. That's a good example. Skirts Ahoy is a really good example. I love some of the domestic dramas that often popped up, like Apartment for Peggy, or speaking of Ida Lupino, Pillow to Pose. Those are really sweet, fun movies, and you often got a lot of those films where it was a bunch of women together trying to navigate the machinations of the war. The few films that you got of women in war zones were very serious. I think of Veronica Lake in probably one of her, the film that she considered her favorite, So Proudly We Hail, which is not nearly as dour as this movie. It is very patriotic and rousing. What I appreciate without getting into the ending too quickly is that this movie is saying that women sacrificed just as much. They sacrificed their lives just as often as men did. It's not them all sitting at home trying to put rivets in planes and working in factories where they're relatively safe. They are actually out in war zones in situations where death is very common, as well as those silly shenanigans like them all being excited to have soap. One of the earliest reviews for this movie mentioned at the time the women had a beauty parlor on Batan. Like, Ella Raines has her great, perfect hair throughout this whole movie. Margaret Sullivan, because she's the planer of the group, is often the one that just looks perpetually dirty. Joan Blondell's got the big curls, and she still looks like a burlesque dancer. And I love that both of those things can coexist. The femininity and the fashion and the frivolity with the horror and the gloom and the sadness. It's the multitudes of being a woman. Samantha, you brought this movie into all of our lives first. What do you think of it? Of course, I definitely echo a lot of your guys' sentiments. The fact that all of these women were brought together on screen in one place at one time is just something to marvel at. Talking about women serving in World War II and having to deal with a lot of these horrible situations, and this is the code, we can only infer what happens after the credits roll, but it's definitely not good things. (laughs) The fact that we're able to see... Margaret Sullivan, who had some great roles, like we talk about Shop Around the Corner, we talk about The Mortal Storm. 
this is a really good example of her in a leading role. And Joan Blondell, a little older as well. We get to see her graceful transformation that she would go through throughout the 40s and the 50s into that really strong supporting role that brought I'm definitely going to take a moment to talk about Diana Lewis, though. I remember the first time I watched this movie, I was just so obsessed with her character and I had no idea who she was as an actress. I was just completely lying to her. I Googled it and found out that she was William Powell's wife off screen. And I just thought that that was the coolest thing ever. And this is her final film, which I love. So definitely check her out. I think she's kind of the dark horse of this movie. She adds a lot of lightness and fun to it, which I love. She's the lightest dark horse. When I was 10 minutes into it, basically once they roll up and you're like, if you're me, I wanted every dress or skirt shirt combo they were wearing as they were pushing a truck through the Philippines. And they were like, oh, these are our refugee volunteers. And I was like, I want all their wardrobes. And to Kristen's point, the cleanest, fluffiest hair you've ever seen throughout. There were so many unexpected things that I'm like, oh man, A League of Their Own really lifted these archetypes hard. And I'd say that Anna Lewis is a perfect example. League of Their Own even has a small Southern blonde who is fixated on men. She's the one that brings her annoying kid on the baseball route. Anyway, there were so many, oh, there's sisters. Oh, there's the very maternal one. I would say in general with the idea of, oh, I would have loved a stronger hand parsing out what's really good, I would have combined some of these characters. There were too, too many women for me. A statement I don't think or say often, but in terms of the narrative thrust of it, I already mentioned Anne Southern, but you're so right. Joan Blondell in this, it's such a different flavor for her. I love that she's this fading burlesque. There's this scene where she tries to distract them by showing them what Oh, and then I would do this, and then I would do this. She has all that, but also still like the ballsy. Everyone in this is so good. Frances Guilford is fantastic and the most underutilized out of all of them. Her character is the one that doesn't even get the shade of an arc to it. But also, shout out, I know we all love Marsha Hunt so much. And seeing her as like fetus aged, she is so young in this and so scrappy and like holds her own and she's often paired with either Margaret Sutherland or Anne Southern, and she's just toe-to-toe. My friend Roger made a documentary. He knew Marsha and directed a documentary about her. So I have grown in my esteem for what she can do. And so seeing her so young and so wonderful, I'm with you the whole way. The team they put together was great. I would have maybe pared them down a little bit to bring out each of their arcs, because then you get just some unnecessary or just the sad moments of, huh, did she ever do anything after she got kidnapped and thrown into a well with cadavers? That plot always throws me because every time I don't remember her leaving and then eventually they're like, she's been missing for days. When did we say she left? Yeah, I, I didn't remember attention. her leaving either this she time. She goes on a walk. Multiple times. I do remember her leaving. It's just the passage of time is so uh, sure in this film. Oh, <laughs> but again, we're all in a bunker. Has it been a week? Has it been two hours? Who, who could say? It well, reminds I- me a little bit of our conversation where we were talking about the Oxbow incident, Kristen, because the artifice of this set makes you feel more constrained these women have entered this situation they are not going to get out of. And even in the moments where they are outside, when they're tending to the wounded men, there's really no sense of scope. That's what's frustrating about watching war movies of this period that focused on women is how small their worlds are presented. When you see something like The Longest Day or any type of war movie of the 1940s, you get crane shots. You get all of these sequences where you're seeing how the landscape looks. And we really don't get any element of that in this movie. The women are introduced. Norris, the Marsha Hunt character, is just like, eh, I'm going to go look for a bunch of volunteers. And she just cuts to this sequence of her with a bunch of women pushing the car. And I was like, 
Did she go to a specific place where there are just women hanging out? You know, they talk about being refugees from Manila, which I'm sure if you were an audience member of 1943 and you're following the news, that might make sense to you. But for me, watching this in 2023, I had to figure out what that meant. The fact that a lot of them are, they're all white women. One of them says, I was working in Manila in this instance. But I do want to shout out Felipe Franquelli, who plays the one Filipina woman in this movie who is not demonized. She is just a woman alongside them. We also do get an Asian man in this film. It's unclear what part he plays, but I did like that we got some characters of color that are not perceived as villains. And she does have a great little part, unfortunately. She was pretty much known for playing this, and I think she was in Back to Bataan, and then she stopped making movies. So her whole career is summed up in one horrible event in war history. But there is no real sense of scope. We don't get how they interact with the townsfolk. We don't get how they interact with any part of the world outside. That is an attempt to keep things as domestic as we can make them in this situation. It's a lot of them dealing with the lack of resources, right? The fact that they only have three types of meat and they don't have soap. The fact that they're concerned about the bombing. So a lot of their issues are still funneled through feminine issues. That's not a bad thing, but it does show how limited the scope was for women making these films. But I, again, still argue that a lot of that are production choices. They might have been budgetary hampered, but the sequence where the three women who love soap more than they love anything else go swimming, beautiful. It's beautiful. It looks fantastic. It looks dynamic. You get a true sense of there's levity to that moment. They're enjoying, they're splashing. No spoiler for a film from 1943. When they show there's a murder that happens in that, one of the women dies. And it is so beautifully captured. You are fearful. It is so much more bloody. I did not expect to see that kind of like, oh, this is a war death. This woman is dying. Any innocent would die in this moment. And there's no flinching away. It's a master shot of her running. You see the whole thing. That was like, oh, wouldn't it have been great to see so much more? They're complaining about they keep having to eat a mule and monkey. And I'm like, I mean, not that I really want to get into it, but why am I not seeing them having to hunt mule and monkey? There's so much more that even in the smallness of this, if you're trying to tell me how terrible it is, you're still sort of whitewashing. This is still giving me the like, this is the safely prepackaged grocery store version. Don't worry about where the meat came from. I just need an image of Marcia Hunt or Ella (laughs) Rains with a bow and arrow hunting a monkey or something. But it does give... Pearl Harbor vibes. I feel like Michael Bay watched this and tried to crib it for the way to write the women when he did Pearl Harbor. Because I think of something like that sequence where the men are wounded and they're having to care for them. There are moments that are just really heartbreaking, even though now I think watching so many war movies in our life, they've become canon. Watching Joan Blondell go up to the young kid and she's like, How are you? And he's like, Am I going to die? And the doctor's behind him like, yep, this kid's dead. And she's got to pretend like, no, you're going to be fine. And then she goes in the other room and starts to sob. That is a scene that we've seen probably in countless war movies. But the way Joan Blondell plays it, this is the woman that performed My Forgotten Man in 1933, in Gold Diggers of 1933. She conveys such emotion in such a small sequence. Or even the Robert Mitchum Because Robert Mitchum's in this movie for one scene. He shows up and he tells everybody that he thinks he's okay and then he dies. But the way that the women feel so impotent that they can't do anything about it. You really feel for their cause, even though we've probably seen these stereotypes in so many war movies. I just have to throw out here that... Number one, I don't know if you guys read this. I just found out today doing the research for this that... Ella Raines' character, Connie, she, in the play, was a Nazi. And she dies. Yeah. In the play, she dies after killing one of the nurses and ratting everybody out. And she's killed trying to surrender. 
Drea was talking about, oh, I don't know about all of these women and all these different plot lines going on. And meanwhile, they cut one of the most major crazy ones, which was just mind blowing to me. If Ella Raines had had the chance to do that, that would have been quite dynamic. I'm so shocked that Ella Raines, her character is supposed to be the Nazi. It would have been interesting to add in that pitch of having somebody be a villain on the other side. This movie's only 97 minutes. It's way shorter than most war movies, which tended to be two-hour affairs. And I would have liked a little conflict in that way of showcasing that women could also be bad people. They can be on the wrong side. I just don't know how I feel about it being Ella Rain. She's the soft one in this movie. She shows up and She's complaining about the way things are. I do wish we had gotten a little bit of that conflict. Twist, she was written as a Nazi. So she's our youngest one. She's the one that holds Robert Mitchum as he dies. Why not? Why not bring out Robert Mitchum? Why not? For two solid minutes of death scene. What would they get? What added narrative do they get from that? Is it like... The complexities of, oh, women from all sorts of backgrounds. Here's one thing that I just have to throw in about this as well, is it would be not only one, but two very distinct similarities to Hitchcock's lifeboat. Number one, you've got the surreptitious Nazi with Walter Slezak in Lifeboat and with Ella Raines in this. But number two, you've got Heather Angel going through something traumatic and screaming her head off in British for most of the movie. In British. But was I'm it? Start Lifeboat. In British. Oh, but Lifeboat's based on a Steinbeck book, right? I was going to say Lifeboat comes out after this. It does, a year after, but I don't, which is what I think is so interesting. But it's based on a Steinbeck novel, and I'm not sure when that came out. Either way, you know what? I am fully would believe that every single property in any format would have a secret Nazi in it in a handful of years. So yeah, that tracks. That tracks for me. In terms of the decisions they did make to pare things down, great thing to get rid of, because they were certainly not going to spend the time investigating why that would be an interesting background for her. The background we were already getting is how youthful she was. And actually, that reminds me, it is a strong turn But I'm turning back to something Kristen said in terms of the concept of sacrifice. Is there anything more predominant in a war picture than the concept of sacrifice? That's what in most scenarios and in real life, that men sacrificing themselves for their country, for the communities, the families they left behind, all of those things. And I find sacrifice in Cry Havoc is so riveting because It's not just that these women have put themselves in a precarious situation and are volunteers in doing so who are just like, we're here, we're near the theater of war, but they're also the constant undergoing threat of malaria and the realities of what the lack of provisions, the lack of medical aid, and how that means. Like, obviously, the key thing for that is you're watching Margaret Sullivan from the beginning deteriorating. We first meet her and she's having a spell. She is slowly dying of this poisoning that they do not have enough medicine rationed to help her. And she's also past the point of, it sounds like any medical intervention that can be meaningful. And yet she remains. And she also is in this secret marriage, not to blow it wide open, but she's remaining so that she can be near the person she loves, even though they can't be forward about their relationship because of the whole hierarchy of everything. That additional level of sacrifice really speaks to me. And it also speaks to, and and I totally agree with Kristen, the women was in my head a lot, that whole idea of like, oh, men are off screen. Don't worry about men so much. But there's still the idea of men in those interpersonal relationships is moving a lot of these wheels. And I was very grateful that the jealousy, the love triangle, all of that was actually so much more nuanced than I was expecting. I was like, uh, am I going to see scenes of this dude flirting with Anne Southern? Is it going to be, yeah, war? What's fidelity? We're all going to die. Who cares what your vows are? But instead, it was more nuanced. It was Anne Southern is maybe a woman 
who has always derived a lot of identity and meaning from the view of men and found someone she likes to flirt with and doesn't understand platonic relationships. There was a lot of really nice complexities built into what we were given with that love triangle that were above and beyond what I was expecting. Sorry, Cry Havoc, for my low expectations. No, and I love that you brought up the whole complexity of Margaret Sullivan's character. I always get Margaret Sullivan confused with Maureen O'Sullivan, just because they both have the Sullivan name and their name starts with M's. That's it. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Margaret Sullivan is really a unique character because she does start out as this character that we've seen before in films, the stuck up woman who everybody keeps telling her, especially Anne Southern's character, that she doesn't know how to have fun. Why would anybody be interested in you? You're just so boring and sad. We've seen that in so many male war movies of the stuck up corporal or somebody who doesn't know what it's like to find joy anymore. Adding in the secret marriage is really fascinating because now we'd be looking at power dynamics, but the fact that men and women are not allowed to serve together and be married, they have to hide this. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon yet? Well, you should, just like Ali Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hoppy, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Kimberly, Krista Painter, and Mick F. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guest on an episode. You also get access to entire bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and our new limited series, But Have You Read the The Series? It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. The fact that women who are married are often perceived as weaker without drawing attention to it. She is having to put on this front so that women will respect her and women will like her And yet it is the one thing that is keeping women from liking her. That is just something that only ages, unfortunately, like a fine wine. It's far more relatable than it would ever be. And I want to mention a lot of women were considered for this role. Joan Crawford was originally announced as playing Smitty. And then it was Merle Oberon. And then they looked at every other actress from June Allison to Eve Arden to Bonita Granville, Susan Peters, Donna Reed, Lana Turner was in there. A lot of other women were considered and the casting of everybody, but especially Margaret Sullivan for this role is just what makes it work. I wish for the people listening, I could bottle the face Samantha just made when you said Bonnie Granville. (laughs) You made such a particular I was just so confused. She's so young. That would just be such an odd choice. I'm assuming it was for a different role. Maybe not for the Smitty part, but... Okay. Maybe, yeah. Sense. Like, if she was getting Diana Lewis's part, that would make a little more sense. In that seasoned role, I would be very, very shocked. Although it makes absolute sense that they had that many heavy hitters vying for this. These are great roles. Not a single one of them is only a girlfriend, only a wife, only a mother. They all have multiple things going on, some better than others. Bless her, I think it was Ella Reigns, was Heather Angel, the sister of the girl who goes missing, who has literally what I would call a conniption fit. Your sister is missing in the time of war. And she's like, no, 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 no. I was like, okay, okay, dial it down. Can you calibrate <laughs> to some of these other performances, please? That's a good thing, too. I always worry the level of hysterics, especially in this movie, is going to be dialed up to like 12 the first night that the bombings happen and they start to freak out. And it's Margaret Sullivan's character says, as long as that lamp isn't moving around too much, you're fine. It's whatever. We see these women express fear, but it's not insanity. They have a plan. They understand even though none of them are qualified to be nurses. Smitty says all of them have first aid. That's it. The one woman is like, I wrote fashion articles for a Manila fashion magazine, which I didn't know Manila in Vogue was a thing, but apparently it is. And the one she said she's like working Manila NPR or something. They have absolutely no skills. And yet 
the movie doesn't really waste time with showing them learning. They're just learning on their feet and are really there just to help keep things moving along. I like that more than if they were experts. It's a much tighter corollary to the boys and men serving of, oh, no, these are people from every walk of life. Not many people spend all of their time learning how to be a trained killer and ruthless in the sight of destruction. And it is something you learn. And that's another reason you get so much from Margaret Sullivan Smitty. I like what you were just saying about having to make the hard choices and to not be likable to her team. That is not what's required of her. What's required is, do they respect and jump when I say jump? The hierarchy of power in any, if it's a platoon, if it's a grouping of women in wartime, you need the people who are following the orders. But Margaret Sullivan you get that moment as well when she's the one who's shaking her head when, I can't remember if it was Ella Raines, but when someone early on was like, oh, he wants a thing. And she denies him some of the medicine. She's like, he's not going to need it. Trust me, I've seen this. She's been through it, has to make the hard decisions, and also is there for her squad, team, whatever, in making those hard decisions. I'll say he does not need it. You do not need to say that, which is a great leadership element. You're getting women in, in roles of leadership. And that's even when we haven't even touched on uh, old Faye Bainter as Captain Marsh, who just pops in for a couple of wonderful scenes. And I would have loved to have seen more of her as well. She and Lieutenant Smith have this, I was like, I 100% believe that dynamic. You for sure get, this is the power structure Here's who calling things, and this is how they have to act in each of their different ways to get things across and to make things happen. It was such a believable dynamic. It's where you get that league of their own element that you were talking about, Drea, because Faye Bainter's character really is the leader of this group, only she has a couple scenes. It would be like if Gina Davis's character only had a couple sequences, but you were like, ugh. Yes, she is the one that is definitely in charge of all of us. I love that. I appreciate that. Even the character of the cook makes herself known in a very small part. Yes, you get the fact that this is a theatrical play transition to the big screen. It's that fences quality. But what Faye Bainter and Margaret Sullivan have is just this sense of history. I mentioned this in the last episode, too, is that you don't believe these characters just live and die by the runtime of this film. You believe that these two have been in the soup, so to speak, for a very, very long time. Faye Bainter, to just keep using modern references, Faye Bainter is like the Jeremy Renner if this was the Hurt Locker. <laughs> the character that you're expecting can't go back to civilian life after this. She's definitely just in this for life. You don't really get that in a lot of other movies of this period. Women are not allowed to be career military ladies. Yeah, I definitely love the part where she is being mouthed off by, I think it's Anne Southern. And she's just like, you know what? You need to get that chip off your shoulder because I don't even have time to knock it off. <laughs> I love that whole part. You're right. I don't see women in leadership roles too often, especially in these military war type of films. One character that I really see a lot of Margaret Sullivan Smitty, and we talk about it a lot in relation to this movie, is Lorraine Day's character in Keep Your Powder Dry, which is such a fave female-driven war movie. It plays as a all women casted from here to eternity. You've got Lorraine Day as your Burt Lancaster character. <laughs> you see a lot of that in Margaret Sullivan too. Another thing that I definitely love and respect is that you don't see that overtired, you stole my man narrative with her and Anne Southern. It's not dramatically hashed out. They're not slinging mud at each other. It's just a very taken care of on the side. Oh, I didn't know that he was married kind of thing. It's settled very maturely for a 40s film. Even though Joan Blondell falls into that trap, she gets shot and they're trying to help her and she's in pain and she's telling a Smitty, hey, you're just upset that she wants to date your man and he doesn't want you because you're a dried up prune. It takes a turn that you're not really expecting. 
But that scene in particular, I appreciated a lot as well, because Drea, you mentioned it earlier, we get to see these women experience a lot of the same war issues that men do. Ella Raines' character is killed during a moment of joy and happiness. Joan Blondell's character gets shot. The other character clearly has shell shock and PTSD. So we really are seeing these women go through the exact same litmus test of war wounds, literally and mentally, that the men get. And it culminates with the end, which this movie is 80 years old. The end of the movie is the Japanese come to round them up. The movie is ambiguous about timing and what all this means. The Bataan Death March, which is probably what most people know that area for, took place in 1942. I don't know if audiences would be putting A with B, but that's how I interpreted it, is that essentially they would be rounded up and in the process, they probably would die. I don't know. Somebody might say that the ending, maybe they're prisoners of war or something. But the fact that the movie does end with the question of whether these women will live to see tomorrow is jarring. Because as most movies of this time period, women and kids, man, you're not hurting any of them. They are definitely going to get the happy ending. If the guy dies in war, he at least knows that his wife and his child will carry on his legacy and his name. These are all, as far as we know, single women with no children. And Smitty, in her case, her husband dies off camera, which that's a gut punch. She, somebody's like, oh, hey, by the way, you know, that guy died. She's like, um, cool. She's got to pretend that she doesn't care. But she's also going to die anyway of malaria. She has nothing to lose. But the rest of these women are young women of childbearing age. They got nobody to carry on their legacy. And the movie just says, you know what? There's a lot of men that died this way. And there is also a lot of women. That is a ballsy move. There's no other way I can describe it than that. It's an incredibly bold ending. I was not expecting it to end there. How are they going to deal with this? How am I not going to see the captors who are arriving that we're just hearing their voices of? Because of course, there are men that we're hearing off camera like everybody else. And then when it ends there and it ends with this tentative reconciliation and this camaraderie between the two women who've been at odds in unique way the whole time, that is a really bold ending. I was very grateful for that because that's the reality of war. None of it ends all of the time. And I know they rushed through getting this into production because of how quickly it was, it was very topical and how it was happening so soon after everything that was going down in that region, one assumes that the contemporary audience of the time would be aware of those things. And then you do have that whole moment where Anne Southern is just marching around with a map that she's gone in and had her not boyfriend tell her. And so she's literally just describing something that happened in the actual war that again, presumably audiences would be like, ah. And the whole twist of it is, we're going to lose this battle but we're going to win this war. And I know that because of this, this, and this. And I was like, well, I'm not following, but she seems pretty confident. And this is a year later. So one assumes that's close to what happened. That part was interesting to me, the topicality of this, this coming out so quickly on the heels of everything and having it all be fresh, be very real, but also how they handle female emotions, both with, they go through the archetype. You have the soldier killed in a moment of joy you have someone shot although there are a few wailing moments that i'm like okay settle down histrionic is the perfect word for it i found the majority of these were very believable emotional responses that i recognized as female responses but there were not the easily dismissed of cinematic oh women women are so weepy women make such an emotional case for everything they should never have the keys to the nuclear football, or I don't know how footballs work, <laughs> nuclear or otherwise. The first time I saw this, I was just sobbing. Samantha gave me no context, but I know she likes Keep Your Powder Dry and a lot of the other peppy movies. And I just figured they'll get medevaced. The helicopters clearly come in any second to liberate them. Nope. No, there is no helicopter. This is definitely one of those movies where it's more apocalypse now. Then it is the Doe Girls. 
in a landscape where violence against women is so often perceived as a domestic thing, something you experience at home. Women are not putting their lives out on the line. You watch so many Hitchcock movies about like, don't date that guy because he's definitely going to knife you in your sleep. You are seeing women put themselves at risk. Yes, they are going to end up hurt and maybe die, but they are creating true sacrifice and showcasing valor, which Lord knows we needed to see that at the time. It's all undone considering once the war was over and if a league of their own taught you anything, it was after the war, everybody go back home and experience your life. Experiencing cry havoc. I don't know how an audience, I wasn't there. Samantha, I'm assuming is our time traveler. I'm assuming she was there. She might be able to tell me. I don't know how any woman leaving the theater in 1943 could go back to work, whatever they're doing. And then in 45, when the war is over, being told, go back home, have kids. Because this movie is pretty much saying these women are leading lives that you can only imagine. And they're true heroes. Somebody can email me and say, actually, this movie is 90% bunk. And I would just be like, I don't care. I don't care at all. I have my doubts that it is. The ending is definitely jarring to me, too, of course, from the very first watch to this last watch, because it's very firmly in the code era. And the other thing that really threw me off as well, someone that we haven't talked about yet, is the director, Richard Thorpe, who... To say that I like him as a director is a bit of a stretch because he's most famous in my eyes for all of the movies that he did with Esther Williams, but he also loved putting Esther Williams in harm's way. Esther Williams called him a dick, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the terminology was used. He had so many different phases of his career. I mean, he directed Double Wedding with William Powell and Myrna Loy. And then he turns around and directs all these Esther Williams movies. And then he turns around and directs some of the most famous Elvis movies like Jailhouse Rock and Fun in Acapulco. He has many phases. However, none are quite as serious as this, which is what I find so fascinating and not quite so female driven. Of course, he's no George Cukor. We made all these comparisons with the women and that all female cast. But with what he has, I think he does a good job. The only issues that we see are in terms of scope, as you guys mentioned. At the same time, that confining sense, the fact that most of the set is just in that little hovel of their home, it gives you a harsher look at the reality, too, that they're facing. I want to start wrapping it up and do some final thoughts. Samantha brought this movie into our lives. We all have thoughts on it. What are our final thoughts on Cry Havoc? I maintain it's... A real outlier in war cinema, if you are looking for a female perspective in a genre that is very well trod and is often just steeped in stereotype, this is one that really breaks the mold. And it's great to see all of these amazing actresses. Ella Raines is great. Joan Blondell. If you love ex-actress and you've always wanted to see them in a different type of genre. If you've seen noir Ella Raines and you want to see her in a war movie, if you've seen comedic Joan Blondell, you want to see her in a war movie, this really does take the cake. I think I thanked Samantha at the time for bringing this movie into my life and I thank her yet again. Drea Clark, what do you think? Final thoughts on Cry Havoc. Agreed. Very similar to yours. I'm very thankful that I saw this. Cheers to you, Samantha. I could nitpick a lot of narrative and character choices in it but in more of a fun way and then in a ugh this is so hard to watch why can't they tighten this thing up it was definitely less of this i found it very watchable it clicks along it's like 90 minutes or something it is giving you just a different perspective that i found for the majority of it to be very meaningful and well thought out in terms of what these women's roles would have looked like in this war effort And also their roles in this pack of women and what that can mean. Any of us who identify as female and have been in a bunch of other women, you always know. It's things suss out really quickly. Who's the what? And I very much dug that. And I agree with Kristen. It's a treat to see people in a different zone or flavor than you normally see them. And Southern in this, I was like, you go. You and your fluffy bangs and your little back of your head braid. 
You go, Aunt Southern. From Congo, Maisie to Batan. Samantha, take us out. What are your final thoughts on Cry Havoc? Oh, gosh. I feel like between all of the different occasions that we've discussed Cry Havoc, we've said so much and hyped this movie up beyond compare. This is a fantastic movie. Gathering all these actresses on one stage, so to speak, is so great. It's such an interesting change of pace for Richard Thorpe. And most importantly, as Drea touched on, it gives such a different perspective on this war and on who served and what they did. Whenever you think of female sacrifice in World War II, the only thing that we ever see is women sometimes held machinery. And they took the men's jobs and sometimes they wore pants. Not they literally put themselves in death's way. This is a perfect example of that other side that we never got to see. And it's played out perfectly. Women wear pants. You see that? I do want to give a final shout out to the coveralls. The women's coveralls (laughs) in this. A work of art. Both fashion forward, but also believable. Well done, coveralls. And I have to touch, too, on Ella Raines' noir hair. I couldn't get over it. Couldn't get over it. I do love that your big takeaway is women wear pants, and they should be allowed to wear pants. Listeners, you can let us know your thoughts on Cry Havoc, women wearing pants, anything. You can email them to us at ticklishbase at gmail.com, or you can send it to us through all social media platforms, including Twitter and Instagram. But before we close out, This episode is very special because not only is it coming full circle talking about Cry Havoc with Drea Clark, the original trio is united. But this is Samantha's last episode. She is going to move on to greener pastures. She's working on a lot of really fun stuff that I don't know if she wants to talk about right now, but she's got a lot going on. No surprise, but she has decided to take a bit of early retirement from the podcast. No disrespect. I love Emily. Emily is not here, but it's just it's going to be very. I told her earlier when she brought this up to me, it's going to be very weird because I don't know if people know this, but I was doing this podcast by myself for a while and I decided I needed a co-host because it was just weird to talk to myself and then talk to people for 20 minutes. And when I solicited the need for a co-host, I got a very, very young, bright girl who messaged me and was like, I'm going to hang out with you and talk about movies for free. And I was like, cool. It has been a delight. We've gotten to go to TCM Film Festival. We've gotten to meet cool people. We've gotten to be friends. I got to go to your wedding reception. Who to thunk? Who to thunk a stray email to hang out with somebody and talk about old movies for four years of your life would lead to a lasting friendship. And I'm going to try not to cry. So You're yeah, it's... Me cry. <laughs> years, by the way, five. Five? I don't know what time means anymore. We lost all those COVID <laughs> years. Just know that I love you and I'm going to miss you. It's going to be really weird going forward, but we will keep the classic film love going and you will be here in spirit. I don't know if you want to say anything oh i just think that's really sweet and these five years have been amazing it's like giving me a vessel to vent all my classic film nerd knowledge onto it's been awesome and getting to talk to you ladies has been so great and i'm still absolutely going to be a friend and fan of the show i hope so because Considering how many people talk about how much they love you on the podcast, I don't know, we might have just lost people. Might just be like, well, screw this show. We're not listening now. Samantha's gone. I know when Drea left, I got a lot of people that said, we miss Drea. When is Drea coming back? Just know they they don't come to listen to me. (laughs) We already have plans for some tentative plans for 2024. There's going to be some great episodes. And Samantha will be here. She's graciously agreed to, because I don't know how to do art, do more images for us. And I'm sure she'll be on many an episode, because who else am I going to talk about Liz and Dick and Esther Williams with? Peter Lawford. Also, she's a time traveler. She's... Right? (laughs) There's things she hasn't seen yet that she's already done episodes for. You never know when she's going to pop up I should really get... these episodes in advance already. (laughs) We're going to miss you. It's going to be a weird transition, but I can't wait to see all the things that I know you're going to go off and do, and it's going to be awesome. Hopefully you will remember us little people 
when you become a big classic film expert. I don't want to talk about what you're doing, but what you're doing is awesome. It's very, very exciting sweet. and I can't wait for it to pan out. Thank you. Very sweet. Lots of stuff to be excited about. It's going to take yes. five ever. <laughs> That's going to close us out. We'd like to thank Drea Clark for reuniting with us to talk about Cry Havoc. Drea, where can fans find and get in touch with you? Is there anything coming up that you would like to plug? I am on Twitter at the Drea Clark. I am still hosting a weekly podcast on Maximum Fun Network called Maximum Film. As of yesterday, the Spirit Awards nominations came out, which I've been producing for the last three months. And then as of today, the Sundance lineup came out, which I've also been programming since July. So a big day for adjacent Drea Clark things. Get in touch. Keep watching movies. That's going to close us out for today. Again, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter. So leave us one on Apple Podcasts. I don't think we've gotten one in a minute. Five stars, please. You can follow us on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at TicklishBiz. You can follow me at therap.com and on all social media profiles at Kristen Lopez 88 Emily Edwards is on all social media at Ms. Emily Edwards. And the amazing Samantha Richardson is where on the interwebs? You can mostly find me on Twitter at Classic Film Geek, but you can find my blog at musingsofaclassicfilmatic.com and my Cooking with the Stars posts over at classicmoviehub.com. Make sure that you're following all of the cool things that Samantha is going to be doing. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our upcoming episode of But Have You Read the Series on Jane Eyre? So consider helping us at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And of course, both me and Emily and maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, Samantha, are all authors. You can buy my book as well as Emily's books wherever you buy books. We will be back on December 20th with our last episode of the year celebrating Disney 100 and the original Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Till then.